All right, this week uh, we're going to talk a little bit about inverse functions, and this is kind of an extension of composition of functions. So it's real important that you understand from last week not only how to compose functions, but what we're doing when we compose functions, how we're sending a function into another function. So let's talk a little bit about what inverse functions actually are. All right, for the inverse to exist, the function must be one-to-one. -one. In this particular lecture, I'm not going to talk much about one-to-one. -one. I have a separate video set aside for teaching you guys what one-to-one -one is. All right, so what is an inverse function? An inverse, inverse functions undo each other. Uh, it's something that we understand very well in everyday life. Like if you go up the stairs, then the inverse is to turn around and come back down the stairs. And the key to thinking about an inverse is that when you perform the inverse, you end up nowhere. You end up ex back right where you started. And this is going to be important when we think about inverse functions because typically we send in the letter x into, say, a function f. And if we undo that function f, then we're going to get back to x. Okay? And so um, it's going to be important to understand this function notation. So uh, we denote the inverse of f as f with what looks like a superscript of negative 1. Uh, that is not read f of negative 1, it is not f times negative 1, and it is not f minus 1. It is read inverse of f. Okay, so when we see that f with a little negative 1 at the top, we read it in English as the inverse of f. All right, and as I was saying, the, here's the math lingo of what inverse functions do. When we compose a function f with its inverse, we get back to just x. All right, so let me grab my, my pen here. What am I trying to say here? Well, since f and f inverse undo each other, we get right back to where we started, which is x. Similarly, since f and f inverse undo each other, co composing the other way, we get back to where we started, which is just the domain, or x. All right, let's consider these functions. f of x equals 8x plus 5, and g of x is going to equal x minus 5, all divided by 8. Are they inverses? Well, we're not talking about solving them yet. This is more of just a open-ended question, and I'm going to tell you right away, yes, they are inverses. So what's a way we can think about it? All right, let's think about if we have 10 as our x, okay? 10 is going to be in my domain for f, and I'm going to send 10 into the function f. All right, when I do, I get 8 times 10, which is 80, plus 5, which is 85. So 85 is the range value, all right? Now I take this 85, and let's send it into g, all right? We're composing functions here, guys. So I send 85 into g, so I get 85 minus 5, which is 80, divided by 8, which is 10. Aha! And you can see I get, in the end, exactly what I started with. I ended up nowhere. I started with 10 and I ended up with 10. It's one way to see with an example how f and g are inverses. All right, so starting with 10, we applied the function f, then we applied the function g on 85, all right, to get just the number 10. All right, what about these two? Are these two functions inverses? All right. Let's perform function composition both ways. All right, first, I'm going to send f of x, my x cubed minus 1, into the function g. All right, so you guys know what this means by now. That means I start out writing my g of x function, which is the cube root of x plus 1. But instead of writing x, I write the f of x function which is x cubed minus 1. So here I have substituted in my f of x into g. Okay? And notice we have x cubed minus 1 plus 1. And so the 1's do indeed cancel, leaving me just with the cube root of x cubed. 
all right, and the cube and the cube root, they undo each other, and so we just end up with x. All right, so again, I compose g and f, all right, and I get an x. Can we say emphatically right now that these are inverses? Well, no, we've got to compose it both ways. So now let's send the g of x function, the cube root of x plus 1, into f. All right, so notice here I've plugged my g of x function. This is my g of x. I have plugged it in to f, all right, which is x cubed minus 1. And right away, I have the cube root, all right, of something that's all cubed. And so the cube and the cube root simply undo each other, and I get x minus 1. Whoops, let me write this. I know some of you are going to ask me a question. Technically, this would read in order x plus 1 minus 1, if we're keeping with the order up here. All right, and yes, the 1s do cancel, and we end up with just an x. Okay, and so again, we composed our function, functions both ways, f of g of x, that equal to x, and g of f of x from the previous slide, that equal to x. And so the function g is, in fact, the inverse of the function f, all right? By definition of the inverse function, the domain of f is the range of f inverse, and the range of f is the domain of f inverse. That's a whole lot of f's and f inverses and domain and range, all right? There's a real easy way to think about it, and you are going to hear me say it at least 100 times over the course of all these lectures to figure out the domain and range for functions and their inverses. Guys, it's simple. The domain and range flip. The x values for f are the y values for f inverse and vice versa. Okay, and so again you can see with this picture if you are a visual thinker that the domain of f is the range of f inverse. Similarly, the range of f is the domain of f inverse. By definition, this is how we end up undoing each other, each function. All right, a few important facts about inverses. If f is 1 to 1, then f inverse exists, okay? So 1 to 1 is something we are going to have to check for. The domain of f is the range of f inverse, and vice versa, the range of f is the domain of f inverse, just meaning domain and range flip for inverses. If the point AB lies on the graph of f, okay, then we can say the point for sure BA lies on the inverse. Why? Because domain and range flip, all right? And we're going to talk, uh, once we get into graphing, about how to get an inverse, we are reflecting or flipping over the diagonal or the line y equals x. All right, to find the equation for f inverse, all right, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to talk about this in the next lecture, but finding the, the inverse boils down to switching x and y. All right, again, if you can keep in your mind that the domain and range flip, then you will always know how to solve for the inverse because domain and range, that's x and y. x's and y's flip, so if I need to find an inverse algebraically, I'm going to switch my